Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis. And Jeff Webb. And you're listening to Tax Tuesday. Welcome to Tax Tuesday, guys. I want to make sure that you can hear us loud and clear. If you could go into the question and answer field and just say yes, then I'll know somebody's alive out there. That'll help. Look at a bunch of yeses and then a few questions. Well, at least nobody replied, no, I can't hear you. Let's see. I know. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I know. Clint likes to do it like a number. If you can hear me, press one. If you can't hear me, press two. He gets a bunch of ones. So, uh, all right. So um, we are going to have to jump into a bunch of stuff today. What? They're giving us ones. Oh, hey, three. All right, you guys. No drinking during Tax Tuesdays. No, actually the opposite. The tax code is something where you really do have to drink wine or something beforehand. If you ever wanted to read it, just like I'm not condoning massive amounts of drinking, but a couple glasses doesn't hurt when you're trying to figure out what the heck these guys are writing. And boy, that CARES Act is making our lives hard. They come out with clarifications on a daily basis of what they really meant. Oh, yeah. And of course, it's not the lawmakers that are saying what they really meant. It's a bureaucrat, which I don't know where these guys are, these men and women. That they, I always think of a really dark place and they're just <laughs> like they're just angry and they're taking it out on us because they never seem to be expanding it and helping it. They're limiting it. Yeah, it's kind of backwards from the way it usually is. Usually it's IRS and the Treasury trying to figure out what Congress said, and now it's the other way around. Oh, my God, it's crazy. Anyway, we're going to get into a bunch of that stuff today, I'm sure. You guys have lots of questions. Um, that was our social media stuff. Hey, if you have questions, you can always send them in. Uh, let's say we take a drink every time the answer is, it depends. I shouldn't have said that, Pam. Uh, what a great game. How do you answer a question uh, or how do you ask a question of Tax Tuesday? Well, it depends. Well, yeah, you it can depends. Send it yeah. via an email or you can uh, type it into the question and answer. So, hey, if you need a detailed response, you're supposed to be platinum. We answer hundreds of these questions every week. You should see our wonderful uh, spreadsheets of this. Uh, we're always trying to make sure that we're staying up on things. Uh, speaking of staying up on things, we had yesterday, uh, by the way, I had a wonderful uh, Infinity Investing session on Saturday. And one of the things we did is we raised some money for one veteran foundation. You guys have maybe have heard me say this before. This is a, a, a ex-Marine who helps. I'm putting the link up there if you guys want to get a T-shirt a t-shirt um and uh, i always just try to help people that are doing good things former all right there is no such thing as a former marine i got it i got it i got it i wasn't going to tell him that but thank you yep so uh he's a marine and uh since retired what would you say retired no you wouldn't even say retired he's just a marine yeah but he's not an active uh, inactive marine inactive marine. Well, some he, days more inactive than others active. But anyway, so they do uh, pet matching with, uh, with veterans that are suffering from PTSD. And right now we're still losing 22 vets a day. It's going to be going up because of all this fiasco. Uh, some people are saying, hey, it was um, seminar was awesome. Thank you guys for all the nice stuff. There's some people saying some nice things. Um, but the uh, anyway, this group here does a very good job. They're able to train uh, service animals for about $2,500. So we know that we've already gotten one veteran matched up. And I know it doesn't sound like great, but it's pretty neat. We're able to fund about, I think last year was 10, 10, uh, 10 pets for vets. These are service dogs that it takes about six months to do. These things are, uh, when, when you actually train a service animal it could be up to fifty thousand dollars if you're going in the um in the in the marketplace and these guys are able to get it done for about twenty five hundred dollars uh, a pet just because they have a fantastic volunteer network and so we just try to help raise a little bit of money and if you want to help them you can go get a t-shirt uh and it's a lot of fun so anyway so a bunch of people are saying hey um 
Thanks so much. Some people are funny. You guys are awesome. Anyway, I, I shot you guys the link. Um, oh, somebody else has an even better link, probably because uh, somebody's more savvy than I am. Anyway, this isn't the live. We're going to raise way more than uh, three or four thousand bucks. Uh, we're going to raise a whole bunch of money. And then what I'm not telling people is we're going to give you guys something at the end of it. We're going to give you guys a little gift. We don't get anything out of it except the satisfaction of knowing that we're trying to help some people that oftentimes go under the radar because they're never going to ask for help. All right. Opening questions. Um, let's see. We got a whole bunch today and we got a whole bunch of questions already coming in. So we'll go through all these questions that you guys are asking. Uh, but here's the ones that we're going to go through that were emailed in. Um, if I have an LLC but treat it as a disregarded entity, do I lose any of, the, any of my protection in a lien situation? So we'll go over that. I have a corporation in California. I took over from my parents. I wanted that particular entity because it was established with good credit history. My plan is to use it as a property management uh, entity to collect rents from our five single family rental properties. I filed zero income tax return for the year in 2017, but not in 2018. Is there a time limit? I could have the corporation and does it uh, and it not show income or would I have to dissolve it after so long? Is there a simple form to file for 2018 and 2019 showing zero income? So we will answer those. Jeff's already all excited because it's tax questions. He and I have these little conversations. Sometimes they're a little more on the legal side and then he's like, eh. <laughs> All right. With COVID-19, will the IRS grant forgiveness with arrears on payroll taxes? <laughs> Did you forget who the IRS is? Uh, we'll go over that. Now, there's there's some things. Um, no, we'll answer that. Can I take the 10K advance from the idle <laughs> loan, which is the economic injury disaster loan, deny the loan and roll it into the CARES PPP? You guys are getting all technical. Uh, we'll answer that. As a flipper in Virginia, is it worth incorporating to avoid dealer status? And is avoiding such actually possible? Good question. We'll answer it. How can I structure my real estate business entity so I can deduct mentoring fees from my W-2 income? Another good uh, question. Um, in a divorce, when one spouse keeps the house, does that constitute a sale of the house and the spouse being removed from the title receiving cash? How can I develop a nonprofit for real estate? Some of your ears should be perking up on that one. Should all LLCs or just my holding LLC register as an escort? Or is there a reason to leave them as partnership taxation? Can a withdrawal be made from a self-directed IRA? And if so, how is this documented to avoid any penalties or tax liability? Those who work full time and have rental income, should they have an LLC or an S corporation? If I have a choice, is it better to buy real estate inside a Roth IRA or QRP? Can we use part of the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program loan funding to fund my employees' pensions, 401k as well as my 401k, sole proprietor, not an S-Corp business? What are the basic benefits of an S-Corp? How would I go about researching tax strategies? Like where could I find a list of strategies? Interesting you ask. All right, if I have not yet filed a tax return for my corporation, do I still qualify for IDLE or PPP as the sole owner operator? So we're gonna go over that, but uh, one of these questions that you guys just asked, which is this, I'm just gonna circle it. How do I go about, I'm gonna give you guys something for free here. And uh, it is literally for free, which means I'm gonna pay for shipping and everything. Uh, and where do I get a list of tax strategies? So this is a COVID special, right? Because it's been a hard couple months. And so the least we could do is try to help you guys keep as much money as you can in your pocket. When we get out of this, uh, I think we're going to be bouncing back. We're already seeing positive signs. Uh, uh, if you listened to us before, gosh, I think it was in uh, early March, maybe mid-March, we were doing classes and everything I was showing up there, uh, you guys, some of you guys might've been on the infinity classes. Uh, we were showing that we looked like this thing was like a 9-11 where it's <laughs> a short-term 
it was going to be back up within six months, pretty much for certain. So we're getting way ahead of it. Like we're seeing it just, just take off. So anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a free book. So this says twenty four ninety five, but what we're going to do is we're even going to pay for the shipping because we love you guys and we always get a good audience. And we know that it's uh, somebody that says I bought mine. We'll give here. You can give one away for free. Uh, you just use the the code Tuesday. So uh, Patty will send you guys out the link. And oh, she even sent the promo code. So I don't even have to tell you guys the promo code. I usually forget it anyway. It's a hard one to remember. Um, anyway, use the code Tuesday. <laughs> give it to a friend if 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 you want to get one for somebody else. Uh, what it includes, though, is, hey, you get the book, but also if you want a, a blueprint, we'll do it. Uh, we'll do a blueprint for you guys, too. No cost. We just like seeing whether we can save people money. Yeah, and if you have an older edition of TaxWise, things have changed so much. You really need to get the new book. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody says, it's not very nice to be wearing a lawyer bearing gifts. Yeah, I passed the bar a long time ago. I've been trying to make up for it ever since. <laughs> Um, it's one of those things where I, I, here's, here's the deal. So this isn't all omnipotent or not. What's the word? Um, benevolent. Yeah. This is because if we're good to you guys someday, you'll just say, Hey, you know what? I really want to do business with you guys. So, um, can we get the book, book signed in Latin? Yes. My favorite quote ever. We just need, he'll see me. I always like to stick that. Cause I took two years of Latin. I don't remember hardly any of it, but a few really bad quotes. The other one are all, Latin swear words. All right. Uh, we have fun stuff. I'll, I'll throw that to you guys. Uh, you guys already have a whole bunch of questions out there. And so I'm going to go through and see if I can answer. Let's see. So if you see the screen Q&A, that means Toby's answering something that's not on your screen. Yes. I get more vicious comments from people like man this is like a pet peeve for people i know me, i can just hear the tude coming through some of them anyway, <laughs> i'm in the process of searching for my next property which will be a va owner occupied quadplex in colorado i'll be living in it for a year or so then refinancing out of virginia and taking it 100 percent, making it 100 percent rental property I currently have six units under my entity consisting of a con while well, you have a lot of entity you have a lot of uh, units in a single entity all in Colorado uh, and he says hey I've talked about setting up a holding entity ideally I'm understanding correctly it may not make sense to put my future purchases in the same LLC yes yeah, so uh, let me just hit this real quick uh, Frank any box just think of it like a, a cardboard box when I do this on stage, I'll usually take some glasses and I'll say these glasses are real estate because real estate is breakable. Just having people on your property, you're not there. Bad things can happen. And if you put two glasses in the same box or three or four, and then you shake it up really good, those glasses break all over the place and they get all over the, each other and they break each other. So one Bad event on one property means I get, uh, I ended up with broken properties all over the place. I can take them all, any equity I have. Uh, when you take those glasses and you put them in separate boxes and just think about when you pack something, you see wine glasses packed up at a Ikea or a Costco or something like that. You could shake up that box and they're not going to get broken because they're not hitting each other. You may have one glass get broken once in a while, but it's not going to affect the others. And that's all LLCs are. They're, they're just a fancy way of saying a box. It protects the glass inside the box. And then there's also the outside protection. And so there was at least one question where I saw, so, you know, that that's going to address that tonight. But the holding entity is designed to protect all of those glasses from you. So imagine that Anything you hold, let's say you're walking down an aisle and you have four glasses of wine in your hands and somebody comes up and, and you tick them off. They could just grab your four glasses because they're just sitting out there. If you put them in boxes and you carried four glasses, like let's say on a tray, they could just grab your tray and now they have all four glasses. If it was in a in a 
non-takeawayable box. You know, so I always say it's a safe out in the desert and they don't even know you have the glasses. There's nothing for them to take away. And so there are certain entities in certain jurisdictions that nobody can take away from you. And that's where we stick our holding entities. I could just tell you right out the gate, it's going to be Wyoming 99% of the times now because they don't even list your name. So nobody knows you have it and they can't take it even if they did. Um, yeah, and we're often asked, well, how many glasses can I safely put in one box? And that goes back to risk assessment. And how many glasses are you willing to go up at one time? Well, think you, of it like this. If you have crystal and it's $100 a glass, just think of it like if you were at home and you were packing these up to to take to a new house. Yep. Would you feel bad if you broke grandma's crystal? Oh, yeah. You know, it, but versus I went to Ikea and I bought, and I actually did this. I had a whole bunch of Ikea glasses and I put them in a plastic carrying bag <laughs> and I was carrying those around. <laughs> Not a single one broke either. They were just, but I didn't care. Like if one had broke it, you know, and cracked, I don't think I would have cried, but if <laughs> sorry, I talked right over you. Uh, let's say in one day, uh, if one day I want to cease being a California resident, <laughs> really it's a beautiful town but man they are just nutty and fruitcake right now uh, i want to become a nevada resident it's not much better here <laughs> you may want to go to texas all the texans are going to say no more californians um and you get yourself out of uh california well if you just move then you just list your as long as you've stayed here more than california that year you would just list yourself right. as a nevada resident you want to leave in the middle of the night. Don't tell any of your friends or family that you're leaving. Um, no, it, it does come down to a calculation of where did you spend more nights? And it does say nights, not days. Yep. It's kind of weird because they just want to, they just want to get you. Um, but I don't blame you. And then after that, you're a Nevada resident, but there's actually cases. Uh, Hyatt, the commissioner, mm -hmm. it actually went to the Supreme court twice. And it was a guy, it was a tech guy. And he tried to do exactly what you're doing. And he had the uh, a sale of his company for like, I forget how many millions of dollars, but there was some taxes owed and California wanted to tax him. So they sent agents into Nevada to dig, break into his apartment and dig through his stuff. And then they were immune. That's the, that, that was the, the whole like thing is that they got nailed by, Scalia and the Supreme Court, and then they went down for uh, damages, and they said, oh, "Well, we're immune, like fifty thousand dollar limit. Like you can't do anything to us." <laughs> that kind of held. Um, all right, so people love the Infinity webinar. Hey guys, come out to our Infinity. Uh, whenever you get a chance, if you want to do Infinity, just shoot over, uh, uh, shoot over on the Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors, and let me know, and we'll get you set up for it. We will give you plenty of. Uh, opportunities to register for uh, the Infinity Investing Workshop. These things have been awesome and we've been dead on. So I feel pretty good about it. Uh, the people that were listening to have done quite nicely over the last few years, um, just because it's not rocket science. We do kind of the opposite of what everybody else is doing. And then you tend to get pretty good results. All right. I have three disregarded properties in three different states. Do I have to pay state taxes in each state? Uh, yes. If you have income from each of those properties, uh, you're going to have to give a portion to each of the states and file return in those states. Most of the states say... Only on that income, though. Like, yes. Most states say you're required to file return if you're a non-resident, if you have at least $1 of income. Yep. The states want to see it. But if you... Uh, if you what, if you don't have any income, then you know most places you're not going to owe any money. You're not going to owe any money. Uh, it doesn't hurt to file a return. So if you build up your out, losses, if yeah. you zero out your rental property, for example, most of you guys are going to have rental property. If you've been listening to us and you know how to do cost segregation, you should not be paying taxes on your rental income. If you are paying taxes on your rental income, reach out to us and say, "Help! I'm paying taxes on my rental income." And you want us to make sure that you don't, uh, unless you really like paying taxes on it. There's ways to to, uh, to accelerate your depreciation and get rid of that. And then you have to buy more property. If you run out of deductions, then 
that's when you have an appetite. It's called a tax appetite, and you go out and start buying things because you want even more. Man, we're getting inundated with. I, I, see, I see it just jumping and jumping. Yeah, you guys don't see this because people's names on it and their stuff, but it's literally like the screen just keeps moving constantly with people shooting stuff in there. Hopefully it's about the book and maybe you guys, maybe we broke the site again. I don't know. Sometimes we do that when we offer things. There's a lot of you guys that register for these events, which is cool. We love having you guys on, but it's free. It's free day. And I'll give you guys that link before we're done again. So you can do more free. The free tax wise, it just came out, right? Uh, um, gosh, I finished writing at the end of last year and then we, it just, it finally got printed. They, their printer press broke. We had all sorts of drama with it, but I wouldn't switch from our printer that I've been using for 20 years just because, I don't know, this is this whole loyalty thing. And maybe I should have done it faster. Um, let's see. If I have an LLC, but treat it as a disregarded entity, do I lose any of my protection in a lean situation? So there's two ways to look at this. Does somebody have a lien against you? Or do you have a lien against somebody else? And like, in other words, does the disregarded entity own the note and do you lose any protection? And the answer is it's going to depend. Um, it's going to depend on the state in which that LLC is created and who owns it. So, for example, we know that, um, for example, in Colorado and in uh, in uh, Florida, the Olmstead case in Florida, that there's some cases where a single disregarded entity could get pierced if the individual and a husband and wife own it. Um, but that is not the case uh, when we put another entity on top of it. So, for example, that same situation would be very different if somebody had a Nevis LLC or had the Florida entity owned by a Wyoming LLC, for example. So you're not going to lose your lien, period. The question is whether somebody could get to it um, if they were to come after you. And so if somebody, let, again, let's, let's use the, the Florida example. Somebody, let's say Jeff lived in Florida and he had an LLC that loaned money to me and had a lien against my house. Um, there's a chance, depending on what Jeff did, that they'd be able to get and take over his LLC and then he, they, it, the, the, the individual that Jeff owes money to would then become the owner of the, the loan to me. So there is that chance, which is why we usually put a holding entity in Wyoming or Nevada or someplace where they can't do that. So, uh, yeah, you could lose some of your protection. But the lien itself, no. It's your ownership of the note that has the lien as its security. Anything you want to throw nope. in there? Um, let's go back to a bunch of questions. <laughs> Holy schmoly, you guys are asking a lot of questions. So I won't keep you here all night. Uh, but wow. Um, somebody says, can we get assigned to a bookkeeper? Yes. A question on the CARES Act, carrying loss from previous years. Will that apply to real property investor? Um, I started being a real estate investor this year, carried losses back to previous years where we have. So you must be a, a real estate professional. And will that apply uh, to a real estate investor? It will if you are a real estate professional. So I know what they're asking. What they're say, what they're asking is under the CARES Act, they unlocked the, the loss carrybacks for net right. operating losses. An operating loss is different than a passive loss, a capital loss. So if you have typical rental income, it is not an operating loss. You carry it forward. Correct. Unless you're a real estate. A real estate professional. That, that So you turn your passive losses into non-passive losses. And then it's an ordinary loss and you can carry it back. In order to be a real estate professional, it has to be more than half your time. It's one spouse, so let's assume that it's one person, non-married. Then they would have to be 750 hours in real estate activities. To, it doesn't have to be on their properties. It's just 750 hours, and they're more than 50% of their personal work time. And then they have to materially participate on their properties, and there's nine different tests to meet there. It could be as little as 
one hour if they're just self-managing. And and how these net operating losses work is you may have a real estate professional, you have a $50,000 loss from real estate. Well, that first goes against your other income for the current year. And then if you have any leftovers, basically you have negative income for the year, that can get carried back to prior years. Yep. And worst case scenario is you carry it forward. Yep. All right. So somebody says, I'm, I'm going to say this is to you because they said to both of us, this will make you feel like Jeff. With this coronavirus environment, family has opted to grant my daughter's wishes for cash as a graduation gift. What is the limit? What are the tax ramifications? Uh, the tax implications to her are zero. Uh, the limitations on the gift is they cannot give her more than 11 point, what is it, 5 million this year? Well, yeah, yeah. so you have the... <laughs> but I know what they're like, asking. The, 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 how about the annual? So the annual exclusion, if it's more than $15,000, then it, they will have to file a gift tax return. But that doesn't mean there's going to be any tax. And that's per spouse. So like if you have, uh, again, it's the, it the, the grandparents? family. Well, it says yeah. family. So... Uncle, aunt, everybody gives fifteen thousand dollars. You could you could load that. You could load your daughter up, and they they don't get a deduction. That's the only thing. Is this is just a gift? So so like assuming four grandparents, they could each give her fifteen grand for a total of sixty, and none of them yeah. have to file tax returns. Correct, and she doesn't have to recognize it or anything. Um, let's see. Do you have a recommended refinance lender that can lend to LLCs with several condos? Um, the one I tend to use, and Patty, you can give this, shoot this over to them, is Corvest, is the one I've used and our clients have used a whole bunch. There's tons out there. There's Angel Oak. If you need hard money, if you're looking for a traditional lender, the world is really weird right now because most of the traditional lenders got hammered doing the PPP loans. And we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. It's over $500 billion of loans all through lenders and it's getting crazy. So. Um, I did see where Citibank was buying up a lot of the smaller banks, PPP and the idle loans yep. uh, because these smaller banks had no reserves left. Yep. What ended up happening is they, they fronted the money and they know they're going to get it back. Mm -hmm. uh, but they ran out of cash. They right. did as many as they could, so they need more money. And the feds came in and were granting people exemptions from the liquidity requirements because uh, it's pretty funny. They were like, dang. Yeah. All right. A lot of CPAs suggest that after business owners make more than thirty dollars or $40,000, they suggest converting from an LLC to an S-Corp. Right now, my business partner and I are interested in buying an investment property. Would converting from an LLC to an escort make it harder to get a conventional loan? The business nets about sixty thousand and gross is about eighty thousand. Uh, they're they're a partnership right now. Right. So um, let me just say, when you're lending, when you're getting a traditional loan on a property, it's going to be different than if you're getting a uh, non-traditional loan. So, like if I'm going in for financing for me to buy a house, it's very different than if I'm buying something with my business. But I will tell you that they do not like partnerships. Nobody likes partnerships. It's the most difficult return to prepare and the most difficult return to dissect. Yep. So you're going to be much better off either taxing your LLC as an S Corp or a C Corp. And if you're doing a loan for yourself, I would actually make it a C Corp because now they'll never even look at the S Corp. Pay yourself a salary. It doesn't matter how profitable the business is. If you take a salary out of an S Corp, they're still going to look at your S Corp paperwork because they yeah. want to see how how successful the business is. Yeah, I, I've seen that even with the S corps, it still gets a little funky and. Yep. So if I want to get a good loan on a house, the best thing you could do is just have W2 income out of a C corp. And even if you borrowed money so it could pay you more salary for three months, so you could look even stronger, you could do that. S corp partnerships, all bets are off, but there's, there's a bunch of reasons. We'll get into it. All right. So you guys, hold on. We are, uh, that's my Adobe. <laughs> yeah, let me kill that. Um, let's see. I have a corporation in California. I took over from my parents. I wanted that particular entity because it was established with good credit history. A lot of you guys may not realize this, but businesses can have a separate credit profile from the owners. 
if you have a corporation, assuming it's a C or an S and it has a DUNS number, an Experian Direct, Equifax Business, those are actually reporting agencies for, uh, for businesses. Uh, there's no trans union or anything like that. It's, it's uh, done in Brand Street. But, uh, and then you actually get a separate credit history for your business. My plan is to use it as a property management company to collect rents, which is great. I filed zero income return for the 2017, and uh, but did not have any in 2018. What limit? There's technically not a limit. You should right. file two 1120s with zero on both, but you need to have about two years of active history. Yeah, you, you need to file a corporate return every year that it's in existence. Uh, but like Toby was saying, there's no uh, hobby loss rule for corporations. Right. Assuming this isn't an S corp. If you have an S corp, then you are in a special layer of hell right now because you have many, many months of penalty. Mm -hmm. If this is a C corp, which I'm assuming it is because, well, I'm making a big assumption. Uh, if it's a C corp, then there's no harm, no foul. There's no penalty. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a number of large corporations, uh, Google, Lyft, Uber, who have been bleeding money for years. Amazon lost money for seven years before it had a quarter where it was actually profitable. I always think that's funny because my brother works for Amazon. Um, what is the deadline to amend tax year 2016? Uh, the deadline is three years from the due date of the original return. Uh, so that would in 17, that would have been April 15th of 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, if it was extended, uh, if that return was extended, you have until the date that that return was actually received by IRS. And so if you mailed it on July 31st, you would have until July 31st they, of this year. Would they get a, uh, would they get a, because everything got pushed to July 15th this year, would they? Our, get yeah, we have some of that. And our assumption is that any, Through July 15th. It would have been due on April 15th. Correct. It would have been pushed out. So you, you need to get hopping. So that individual, you need to get hopping. Uh, somebody's making fun of me more. I know you guys have been asking a lot of questions. We're almost like we're getting within 20 minutes of your of, of the questions. Uh, yes, you should be able to. Let's see. Uh, if an EIDL is declined by SBA, can we apply again and request reconsideration? It's more than likely if they're declining it, it's because either something was done in the application or your credit was not high enough. They are running credit on individuals to determine. And yes, there is a an appeals process that you can go through an appeal. I don't know if they're doing any of them. It might be better to... Uh, how would you do it? Find somebody else to apply them? On, I, I think I probably would. I'd bring, bring somebody else in to, to see if they have somebody else who's associated with your business that can uh, put their credit on the line and reapply. Uh, how can I uh, obtain sales tax exemption for my 501c3? That's a state issue. And you would actually go to your state taxing authority and there should be a sales tax exemption application where you file it with your uh, 501c3 letter from the IRS. Uh, if you do not have the exemption letter from the IRS, uh, they may take the application because you have uh, 27 months to get that completed uh, from the date that you start your business or the date that you want it to be effective. Uh, are you able to use margin go short in a solo 401k use for trading? Yes, but I wouldn't recommend doing that, <laughs> using margin in 401ks, unless you're a really good trader. Um, it's just not, that's not something I would ever do. All right. Just because I watch the ramifications of people getting, usually somebody goes to a couple of classes and they get, they know enough to be dangerous and they, and they do something. But if you, if you think that there's something that you really have, like you're a professional, then yeah, you could absolutely do that. So you cannot have loans in an IRA without having a ramification to for tax. It's called unrelated debt finance income, but you can inside of a, a 401k. And that's actually going to come up in a future question um, today. 
All right, with COVID-19, will the IRS grant forgiveness with arrears on payroll taxes? Um, for those who don't know what this is, this is probably uh, payroll taxes that were owed from a previous quarter or previous year uh, that have not yet been paid. And IRS is not going to give forgiveness on this. The only relief you have right now is IRS collections is not happening at the moment. July 15th. Yeah. What Jeff said. Let me go over, though, some of the uh, benefits that are actually in the CARES Act and in its, uh, what do you say, progeny before it. Mm hmm uh, there's an employee retention credit, which came with the CARES Act, which is a $5,000 per employee refundable tax credit. So if you have back taxes owed, employment taxes, mm -hmm. what will end up happening is you'll get a credit that you'll apply to that. So you won't right. actually have to pay it. Uh, employer pay tax deferrals. If you owe tax right now, instead of paying it, you could apply it to your to your back taxes. And then you don't have to pay what you're incurring right now until December 31st, 2021. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot, or 2022, that's actually half and half. So you're not gonna be paying that tax for a long time. If you have employees that you're required to do sick leave, you get a refundable tax credit as well that you can apply to your back taxes. And uh, there's a payroll credit for uh, uh, family leave, which is when you're having to take care of somebody who had COVID. Yep. Um, and these come back to you as a credit, which you can apply just like cash against your past tax liability. Uh, does that make sense? Yep. All right. Hey, more questions up here. Let's see. What else we got? I'm trading. Oh, wait. Somebody asked. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. I'm going to go down. I'm just... You guys are asking so many questions. It's pushing anything that I select down. Aye, aye, aye. All right. What do you think about cash value insurance under tax code 7702? Would you recommend you use it? Yeah, absolutely. I've talked about this a number of times on these shows, but I'm a big believer that if you get insurance, it should be permanent because otherwise uh, they're going to take it away. Term insurance, statistically speaking, will pay out to your beneficiaries 1% of the time. Uh, if you get a whole life policy, that goes up over 40%. And if you fund your whole life policy or your index universal life policy uh, with enough monies, then you never have to worry about it. It's 100%. And you can use the death benefit if you need to for long-term care, which is huge. So I always look at it and say, I want to cover a bunch of known threats and I'm going to use... Uh, insurance and uh, specifically tax code 7702, which allows the cash value to grow tax-free. And if I need it, I borrow it out. And then the proceeds, the income tax proceeds are non, um, they're non-taxable in the vast majority of situations. Unless you deducted a key man policy, that would be taxable. But for individuals, you never, that's never the case. So they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, you, but not all policies are made the same, I would use a fiduciary, meaning that I'm, I would use somebody who has to put your duties be, uh, ahead of their own or your interests ahead of their own, uh, simply because there's a lot of bad actors out there in the insurance field that love to jack up their commissions and it comes out of your money. So, And keep in mind with these cash value policies, the earlier you start, the cheaper they are. Yeah, get them for yeah, get them for. Because I hear a lot of here. young people say, "No, I, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'll wait until later." And yep, it's amazing how much they go up. Yep. Somebody's asking for calculating hours towards real estate professional status. Can I count the hours that were spent on properties we did not close? No, you actually can't use that. You're looking at your actual involvement with your properties for material participation when it comes to. Um, the 750 hours, it's anything involved in real estate, whether it's yours or not. So you could be a real estate agent, you could be a developer or whatever. You could not touch a single one of your properties and you still count those hours. Uh, also, what about the hours finding a CPA? Nope, that doesn't count either. Nope. So 
you got to be messing with you. You know, it's got to be real estate, buy and sell, development, construction, etc. Uh, can I take the ten thousand dollar advance from the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, under the SBA? Deny the loan and roll it into a carrier's PPP. All right. So here's the big thing. That $10,000 advance is a grant. You never have to pay it back. I was going to say that. Go ahead. Oh, you take it. No, and there's a lot of confusion about that. that mm -hmm. uh, and it's up to $10,000. It's not a $10,000 grant. You get $1,000 per employee. Correct. Uh, so that is not a loan. Uh, so if you did take get a loan, uh, you could roll that EID, EIDL loan into the PPP. Uh, but the 10,000 grant is a $10,000 grant, meaning it doesn't get repaid. Yep. You never have to repay it and it doesn't get rolled into your PPP. If you got the grant then, and you got a PPP, then you lose whatever the grant was comes off of the forgiveness of the PPP. So, right. yeah. And so you can deny the loan. And then if you get a PPP loan, that 10,000, you just never have to repay, but you're not going to get to use it twice. You're not going to get to yeah. have the forgiveness under the PPP for that 10,000. Hope that makes sense. Um, gosh, you guys are asking a lot of questions. I'm trying to keep up with all the questions that are buzzing in. So I'm just going to hit, hit a few of these. Sorry to be a, um, a Hobart, but is there a benefit to getting a better business bureau credit score for a real estate LLC? No, you do not need that. South Dakota trust, more of a legal question. Are they I don't know what the question was, but uh, South Dakota tr trusts are awesome, by the way. They're number two on the list of the most, the best jurisdictions in the United States, right behind Nevada for asset protection trusts. Um, how do I get OER? Oh, this, um, please don't pimp out Texas to Californians. <laughs> He's got a point. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I always get those. Uh, let's see. I'm trading stocks. I moved my trading account into an LLC last month. If I set up a C Corp and move the LLC to a C Corp, is there a way to me to write off education membership items? Um, technically, you either trade, like, you don't have to move it. You could actually retax your LLC and you just choose to treat it as a corporation. Right. Right. Um, and the other thing is you can always have a LLC that holds your account and have a uh, make it a partnership with a corporation as one of the partners. And then you could pay up to the corporation to split income, but also to, so it can pay its expenses. Um, let's see. Gosh, there's a lot of questions. I'm going to keep going on to the ones that are here because there are so many. And you guys write books. I should have said you got to ask your question in like two sentences or less because some people are just going off. All right. As a flipper in Virginia, is it worth incorporating to avoid dealer status? And is avoiding sets actually possible? What say you, Jeff? Oh, I say absolutely. Um, I think it is worth flipping inside of a corp in cor in corporation. That's what am I saying? A corporation. What is flipper anyway? A flipper is somebody who buys a property with the intent of rehabbing and selling it, uh, not renting it, not using it for investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the problem with the dealer status uh, is that it can taint your other properties that you may have, it could taint your investment properties. Uh, should you sell one and they decide, no, you're a dealer, you don't get capital gains treatment for that rental sale. You get treated as ordinary like everything else and uh, and there are there are some other issues with the dealer status, but uh, yeah, I like keeping the, the flips in the corporation. I do too. When you're a dealer, it's it, it, again the 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 way to look at a dealer <clears throat> is when I buy something, it's the intent to sell it. It's no different than a mini mart buying Cheerios, putting it on the shelf to sell it. You don't get to treat it like you would normal investment properties. For example, if I want to, I, I do get some depreciation, but it's not the same. Typically in a dealer property, it's it's going to be, everything's going to get added into the basis. And when I sell, it just reduces the, the, the sale price. I'm not able to do installment sales, 1031 exchange mm -hmm. 
and the income is all active, meaning it's subject to self-employment tax. I do not want myself to be tagged as a dealer. Now, if you're buying properties to sell, you just want to create somebody else to blame, and that's the corporation. So you want to be at a point at the corporation and say, that's the dealer, not me. When I do anything, it goes on my Schedule E as an investment property. When that dang corporation does anything, it's flipping, and that's what you do. Now, what are your thoughts on wholesaling? Same thing? Same thing, because I don't actually own the property. Or if I'm doing a double close, I'm getting short-term income, and it's ordinary income that's subject to self-employment tax. Uh, let's see. I'd like to set up a foreign non-Nevada corporation for a Florida C Corp. Your advice. You can do that. You can set up a – people do that. Think of the uh, the uh, S&P 500. All those companies, for the most part, are Delaware, Delaware corporations, mm-hmm. and then they register wherever they're doing business. So you could certainly do that the other way around. People always ask, why not Delaware? It's great if you're going public because they have a strong history of rights for shareholders and directors. You know what we don't want in a management entity? Strong rights for shareholders and directors. Like we want the, we want to be all about the ability to self deal and things like that without restriction. I don't want to have somebody that owns 1% come through and make a mockery of my, my family structure. I want to make sure that I have control and uh, until I want to pass it to somebody else. So it's the opposite. If you want management, strong management, you go to Nevada and Wyoming. If you want to go and, and sell your entity to, to third parties and have strong rights for them so that they, it adds more value, you go to Delaware. Um, if I sold a, if I sell a rental property purchased two years ago, but I didn't place it in service until six months before I sold it, does the original purchase qualify for 1231 treatment? Um, part of the remodel would have to be short term. No, it's, it's, it's the date that you purchased it. It doesn't matter how long it was actually in service as a rental. Right. Uh, what matters is it was a capital asset that you bought, held, intended to hold, and you held it for two years. You're going to get long term capital gains, and you could 1031 exchange that as well. Um, Somebody said, I'm in Florida and I'm confused. I have four properties in my self-directed 401k LLC. I've been told to move them into land trust. Should I? I want to protect my retirement. Um, So, Karen, the answer is I would just create LLCs underneath that 401k and just have them in separate LLCs. The land trusts aren't going to provide you any asset protection um, at all. It just doesn't. So you may as well just have them in your name. Oh, I didn't even advance the slides when I was doing that. So by the way, if you're doing the flipping in Virginia, the, this is the fees. What you want to make sure is that you don't go online to somebody who's going to give you like a million shares because you're going to pay $1,700 a year to the state for that versus if you had somebody give you like a thousand shares, you pay 100, pay the 100. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going on into a few more questions because we're getting close to the it's 350. How can I structure my real estate business entity so I can deduct mentoring fees from my W-2 income? This is so Jeff. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I tell you, I sometimes struggle with this because uh, the mentoring fees need to have something to do with the business you're actually in. I don't think you can write them off on a W-2. You have miscellaneous itemized deductions. Gone. I, I'm a well. That's true. I and and I don't know what type of real estate business they are. If they're flipping or if they're rentals, mm-hmm. um, we usually like seeing these uh, these type of education mentoring fees in the corporation, uh, especially a corporation who is managing the real estate business uh, or the real estate business entity. Uh, mm-hmm. But like you said, Toby, that. Uh, as far as writing them off against the W-2, you're not going to be able to do that. The only way you're going to be able to do that is if you have an S-corp real estate entity that's flipping and maybe creates a loss and it's an ordinary loss. And part of that loss is made up of the mentoring fees. 
as an ordinary necessary business expense, but you're not going to ever write it off on your W-2 as a mentoring fee. Not anymore. They got rid of it. Unreimbursed uh, business expenses, mm -hmm. toast. They're gone under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Those things were gone two years ago. So you're either going to set that real estate business entity up so it can reimburse you perhaps if you paid those expenses, but that's about the best you're going to get. Um, yeah, you're not, you're not going to be able to reduce your personal income with it. Anderson Advisors suggests the use of a Wyoming LLC for California land trust and California rental property. While it can save $800 franchise tax, how does the law protect a Wyoming LLC in this scenario? Uh, are there cases and terms and all this fun stuff? All right, so here's how it works. A, I know what you're asking. So a land trust is a fancy way of saying, I've transferred title into two pieces. The legal owner, which is the trustee, and the beneficial owner, which is the beneficiary. And this came about, they call them Illinois-style trust because this is how the Sears Tower was built. This is how Disney World was built. They didn't want the world to know that they were coming in and buying these chunks of land, so they would buy it through a bunch of different names. So once we know that we can take the beneficial interest, we can transfer that to anybody we want. Um, if I transfer it to a third party, that's, a, that's deemed a sale. If I keep it within myself and my control, then it's not. So I could put it in an LLC and voila, I just protected that beneficial interest. How will California treat it? They're gonna, the suit is actually going to be against the trustee and the land trust. And they're going to try to torpedo it. And then they're going to try to attach the beneficial interest, which means they got to go out of state. And does California like that? No, because they have to go out of state. Now you got to go chase somebody that's an out of state. And this is no different than if I set up a trust in California and just imagine that it was set up for my grandkids. And I had a, even if I, I, mean, I, could, I could technically, I could have a California trustee. I could have a Nevada trustee. Mm -hmm. My beneficiaries could be in 50 different states. California is just going to sit there and gripe. It doesn't change their lawsuit against the trust. It just changes the lawsuit against the beneficiaries and how and how it's going to have to proceed so it makes a it makes a nice mess which means these things don't go any farther than getting settled uh, i got a veteran sober guy here 27 years he paid let me see i'm trying to this is a long one uh, Actually, Patty, why don't you grab this? I'm trying to figure this out, and it's too long for me. Um, can international real estate be put in a trust or an LLC? If yes, what are the advantages? Well, if it's out of our jurisdiction, you wouldn't put it into something here unless the individual who owned it was here and you wanted to make it part of their estate. But if you had, like, Spanish real estate or something like that, it would have to be in a – the the vehicle would be a Spanish entity. And then if you as an individual in the United States owned it, and you want it to be covered by your estate, we would just denote it as an asset. But what you'd end up having, because the way the United States works is we tax anything, no matter where it's located. Um, but you'd still have to, to, to handle the transfer of that interest in Spain or whatever jurisdiction it is. So, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a sticky wicket there. You got to be dealing with both, or Canada. We could deal with Canada a lot too. Um, if you're a W two earner and have rental property but don't qualify as real estate per, uh, professional, what are your options? Then the real estate would be passive, with one exception. Uh, if you're not a real estate professional, you could be an active participant in real estate, and if your income I hate to get this technical, but if, it, if your income was $100,000 or below, you can write off $25,000 a year against your active income. That's the only other exception. And then it phases out for every $2 above $100,000, you lose $1 of deduction. So at $150,000, it's gone. Right. If you have excess passive loss, you carry it forward. And then that passive loss is released 
when you sell the property and it becomes ordinary loss and you can write it off then. I should let you do that. You, you did do fine. That. That's that's nerdy tax. All right. Do all LLCs have an operating agreement, even if it's not multi-member? What say you? Do all LLCs have an operating agreement? Yes, they should. Yeah, that, that's their body. So you have to have a body. A corpus? Somebody say they got to have a body. Natasha, is it too late to send a question? You can send questions. I am going through these in order. We are still way behind. You guys ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Christmas, you guys. I don't even want to look ahead. From here on out, they have to be written in Klingon. Yeah. Uh, can a business buy a car every year with Section 179 and bonus depreciation? Yeah, but you got to be using it for business. This can be taxable to you. And here's part of the problem with that is if you buy a new car this year and then sell it, take 179 and sell it and then buy a new car next year, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're going to have to you're going to have to pay all that back. You're going to have to recognize all that 179. Is well, you recognize it back and then you take another deduction. Right. So it's bad. Let's just put it that way. Just don't like I know people will do that. But there's a tax ramification. If you're not spending, more, if that vehicle is not being used more than 50% in your business, you're going to get tased under 179 because it's going to be ordinary income to you. Now, if you're talking some type of construction entity or HVAC or something like that, and you're buying a new vehicle every year, and that's that's a different animal because you're you're you know you're you're filling out your fleet, right? But if you're if this is a car, and I'm like, hey, I had a what was it, my Ted's. It was one of my relatives, I'll just say that, mm -hmm. owned a gas station in Tallahassee, Alabama. If anybody says Tallahassee, then it's Tallahassee's in Florida. Tallahassee is outside. It's Lake Martin in, in Alabama, and he had a ga gas station there, and he would buy a new Cadillac every year. That was the biggest thing. <laughs> it was like he was a big, what do they call it, big ball, and it was, mm -hmm. he was, uh, yeah, he, he, he enjoyed his life and he would get a new, be like a sedan DeVille. This thing was a boat. You could put an outboard on it. All right. In a divorce, when one spouse keeps the house, does that constitute a sale of the house and the spouse being removed from title receiving cash? No, this, this is just a property uh, division as part of the divorce and property divisions are never taxed. Um, you're getting half of that. You're getting the house, and they're getting cash. Or I've seen the retirement benefits divided up. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's not going to be any tax involved here. The only issue you have is you guys each have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar capital gains exclusion if you lived in the house two of the last five years. And the second you take a spouse off the name, one of those 250s goes bye-bye. Right. So if you're thinking of selling that house, you're better off keeping both parties on it and selling it. And as long as you lived, both spouses lived in there two of the last five years, and you both own it when it's sold, you get a $500,000 capital gains exclusion. That's the only time when I would, I would fight against that somebody's. Like, there's got to be some Bama boys out there. My dad was a War Eagle, so let's see if anybody knows what that is. War Eagle. And then the uh, it, it, University of Alabama guys, what do they say? World Tide. Yep. That was my dad's second favorite team. All right, let's see. Uh, so no, no tax implications there. We have a ton of questions. Oh... Uh, are you suggesting a term life is a no-no, but you should be only be looking at universal life due to payouts? Uh, I am saying that if I am using term, it's for a very limited period of time. And I'm not using it for end-of-life decisions uh, because it's chances are 99% of the time, it's not going to give me anything because I'm just giving my money away. Um People love to get into it. Yeah, I, I like I like it in very specific conditions where it is to pay off an asset loan or something like that. I'll tell you guys, I took a uh, I sublet a uh, some space once to a guy. It was really high end space, and it was too small for us. 
So we took a higher, we took another uh, floor and we sublet out the space that we originally had. And the guy that took it over, I said, hey, it's got five years on this lease. You could extend it another five years. Uh, why don't we just bunch by a 10 year term policy? So if you like, I hate to say it, but if, if something happens to you, I want to, I don't want to have to worry about my lease. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll sublet it to you. The landlord's happy, but they want to keep us on the hook. The guy would never have qualified by himself. So I was like, Hey, we can help you out, but I just want to make sure that if something happens, so then I'll just do a cheap term. But that's when I'm creating a legacy plan, I want to know it's there. And there's people that will actually go out and get uh, financing so they can do a single premium payment. Um, and then if you're worried about mecking, we could even have an ent- uh, a, a nonprofit uh, buy it. Then we don't have to worry about mecking. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see. There's some questions on here. All my properties are in a blind nominee trust. Beneficiary is either Florida S Corp. That has been accumulating depreciation with no escape hatch, which led me to an OZ fund formation as a sole. Well, the OZ fund is deferred. Hmm. That's interesting. So he's, uh, I'm not going to read that one just because it's, it seems more, it's not really a question. Should I create a separate LLC? For each investment strategy I engage in, for example, one for lean deeds, another one for fixing and flipping, another for a retail business. Um, actually, yes. Under all those scenarios, the only one that I might put together is the tax liens and deeds inside the, the, the fixing and flipping if I'm not going to keep the property. If I'm going to keep the property, then I would probably separate those out. But definitely the retail business separate from the fixing and flipping. Um Let's see, if you have an LLC in your state that is owned by a Wyoming LLC, your state has your information. How does the Wyoming keep your keep your anonymity? You should come to our classes uh, because we'll show you how to do that. <laughs> There's actually a really easy way, and it's way easier than you're realizing. You set up the Wyoming first, and then you set up a member uh, a member managed LLC in your home state, and you list the uh, Wyoming entities information as a result. And then you don't have your name listed anywhere anymore. Uh, we are working on a JV product set up as an LLC. We did not set up a checking account. What? What is liability and can anything be done to rectify? Yeah, get a, get a, uh, get a checking account for the LLC. And then if the, if your corporation has been paying all the bills, Make sure that you have an accurate accounting and treat that as probably either as a loan to your organization or to advance, same thing, and make sure that, uh, that that you get that handled. It's not going to kill your entity. In fact, not having a checking account in your entity won't kill your entity. Right. It is a factor, but it is not even considered a dispositive factor, meaning it won't, it won't torture you. Uh, how can I develop a nonprofit in real estate? Oh, you're looking at me? You like these. I've been hobarting. I know I do. Uh, well, I, I'm kind of mixed on this with the nonprofit, the chicken and egg thing. Um, do you do you buy the real estate first and then put it in the nonprofit, or do you put the cash in the nonprofit and? Well, let's talk about the nonprofit first. What is it doing? Well, you do have to have a plan for the nonprofit as to what its uh, charitable purpose is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we talk about uh, RALs, uh, residential assisted living. It's a nonprofit activity. Yep. Uh, low income housing. Homes for uh, vets. Homes for vets, so homes, forth. Homes for uh, uh, people that need assisted any sort of living. So uh, adult autistic children. Like they're, they're adult now, I should say. Mm-hmm. They're not children. But uh, adults, anybody that needs help with an activity of daily living, which could be cooking, cleaning, uh, even just somebody to make sure that they're, you know, that they're dressed when they walk out the door. Right. Um, Cause there's situations where someone is just, they're not paying attention to the same things everybody else is due to a condition of some sorts, or they just need assistance or you're trying to help a disadvantaged group. So it could be 
uh, anything from incarcerated individuals transitioning back into society. You could get very specific, like women leaving incarceration that were drug crimes. You could be veterans that are that are uh, that have had PTSD. You could have veterans that have uh, you know that are clean and sober houses. All those qualify as a charitable activity if you want to run it in a nonprofit. Low to uh, moderate income housing is a nonprofit activity as long as you hit it's either 60 or 75 percent of the receipts are from those activities. You can even have some higher end houses in there, but all of that. And all you do is you create whatever it is going to be your focus and you set up the entity. It's going to be a corporation and you're going to go through what's called a 1023 application, which is pretty extensive. If you want us to do it for you, we've done well over 3,000 of them. We've never had one denied. We're very good at it. Just reach out to us and we'll walk you through it. And we also teach a class if you want to. We invite all of our platinum folks, but we, you know, we make exceptions. If you're truly charitably minded, we'll give you uh, access to the Start, Fund, Grow. You just reach out to Patty uh, and she'll get you set up there because we want people that are charitable to actually – um, get all the help they need so that they can do that. Somebody asked a good question. Property sold at a $50,000 loss. Ouch. And they want to be able to write it off. What do they have to do? If it's a uh, personal property, uh, meaning your residence or second home, you, you can't write the loss off. If it was an investment property. If it's an investment property, uh, it's going to be a capital loss. Um, so it's going to take a while to recover that loss unless you have other capital gains to offset that. When do you, when does it become business property where you get that ordinary loss? Uh, that's usually going to be the recapture of any depreciation. Um, if I had, if I have, um, passive losses when I sell it. So let's say the same property, they have a $50,000 loss, but they had passive loss carry forwards and they would offset their ordinary income with that too, right? Yeah, and what I said was was actually incorrect. Uh, there is no recapture when you have losses. Correct, Mundo. But I, I also think that when you're disposing of, of a business property, that that's gonna that loss would be ordinary, wouldn't it? Uh, there are cases if it was held for a short period of time, uh, but most of it I think is going to end up as capital. Mm-hmm. Gain or loss. Unless you had loss carry forward, in which case it becomes ordinary. Right? Loss carry forward. If I had a loss carry forward on that property, let's say I had $100,000 loss carry forward. Then I sell the property and it's at a loss. The loss carry forward gets released. The loss carry forward does get released, right. and that is ordinary. You're That's correct. That's ordinary. And then my capital loss would be whatever it is that you had capital right. loss. Right. The actual loss when you sold the property. Yep. It's a little confusing, I know, guys. I'm confused. For all of us, <laughs> it's never. That's why, it, you know, like, so that for the drinkers out there, it depends on your situation, right? You gotta, you gotta look at it. I wish there was cookie cutter. Here's the answer for everybody. There isn't. Uh, should all LLCs or just my holding LLC register as an S corp, or is the reason to leave them as a partnership? I like this question a little bit differently, and that. I think about what kind of taxable entity I need for my entity. If I'm in an operational business where I'm buying and selling uh, goods, uh, I have employees, I probably want to put that in an S corporation. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about flipping earlier, put it in a C corporation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can use the LLC to fill any of these different types of tax entities. Mm Mm-hmm. Or you can use a, a limited partnership for a partnership. You can use a regular corporation for both the S and the C corporation. Uh, it depends on it, it depends. everybody drank. Yep. It depends <laughs> on what you're doing. Entity. If this is a holding entity, and it's truly passive, like it's just holding our shares, then that holding entity would normally be a partnership or disregarded. It would almost never be an S corp. Because if it's an S corp, then anything underneath it is going to be taxed under that S corp. And if you have right. real estate, for example, if you, second you pull that real estate, the real estate out to refinance it, it, you get hit with ordinary income. 
So we talk about partnership and S corporation, but a lot of times these LLCs are disregarded. They're ignored for tax purposes. So when you hear disregarded, it means the IRS disregards it and they look directly at the owner. Nothing wrong with that. The only time that there's something wrong with that is when you have a whole bunch of real estate and you're trying to get financing, in which case, especially if it's uh, an apartment complex or commercial real estate, good luck selling it without a partnership tax return. Like mm-hmm. Even the sub entities, even your little holding entities, you'd want that to be a partnership. Like you'd want to have you or your entity or something owning another little piece to make sure it's taxed as a partnership. So short answer, you're going to fit each LLC to what it needs to be taxed as. There's not a cookie cutter. So the only time there's cookie cutters when you're doing like the same transaction over and over again. So if I'm buying lots of single family houses, which I love to do, by the way, but I'm gorging myself with them lately. Um, there's so many good deals out there. And you just that might be, hey, I'm sticking each one in an LLC. And that LLC is owned by my holding LLC. Patty has to deal with all this crud for me. And then we say, <laughs> if when we're buying an apartment complex, do this. When we're buying it with another party, do this. When it's one that we're not going to hold for very long because we're buying it, it's a burnout, we're going to turn it and just make some money on it, do this. And then you're just saying, if it's this scenario, but if, if we're just constantly buying these little cash flow machines, it's super easy because you just do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. We're talking 150 of them. Like you just keep doing it over and over and over again. And it's somewhat easy. Poor Patty. She has to deal with it. Uh, what did I answer that one? <laughs> yes. All right. You did. Let's go through a few more of these. Uh, I need to be drinking. All right. Um, I never... Uh, I have an LLC that I've never used. Should I close it? Not necessarily. Uh, It's not doing anything for you. It may have use. Somebody may want it. That's called a shelf entity. I moved from California to Oregon at the end of last year. Do I need to change my corporation to Oregon? Depends on, don't you just love that? I'm just imagining these guys just getting snookered now because every time we say depends, I'm imagining you guys all drinking way too much. Some of them are under the table. Right. So do I need to change my corporation? Not necessarily. If it's an out-of-state entity like it was uh, Wyoming and it's not doing business in your state other than you living there, then no. Um, There are so many questions that I've not answered. I feel really guilty. I properly, well, we already did that. I loaned money from my IRA to an LLC. The loan matures and the owner of the LLC go ghost. What or how do we proceed after maturity to recover the funds? Well, I hope you have uh, security on that. Mm-hmm. If you don't, then it's time to get a retain an attorney to go um, after that individual. Hopefully, you have a, a personal guarantee on that too. Otherwise, it's going to be really tough to get it. Um, we applied for an EIDL, though we were denied. Processed a four hundred one k loan, then received a thousand dollars from the idle. Then you weren't denied. Now I have an option to take a small loan from the SBA. How do I decline the loan? You just don't sign their documents. Like they literally, the thousand dollars is yours to keep. Sounds like they gave you an emergency grant. Mm-hmm. You get to keep that. You don't have to do anything. Everything else you get to say no, thanks, but no thanks. And they're going to give you a note. They're going to ask you to sign a uh, a loan document. Can a withdrawal be made from a self-directed IRA? And if so, how is this documented to avoid any penalties or tax liability? Yeah, this is simply uh, anytime you have a withdrawal distribution from an IRA, you have to issue a 1099-R. So you would issue a 1099-R to yourself. It would get mailed into the IRS. That would be their evidence. Uh, as far as avoid, the avoiding penalties or tax liability, uh, that's going to be based on current law that any distributions taken out at this time mm-hmm. they're, they're gonna uh, are, are going to avoid any penalties. They're going to give you a 1099-R, right? Yeah, so he, he, this is self-directed, so yeah. uh, yeah. if he doesn't have some kind of custodian, he's going to issue He has issue. to have it, and a self-directed IRA has to have a custodian. Okay. It's when you have the 401k where you don't have a custodian, like ours. Mm-hmm. We do the loan docs. If you do an early withdrawal, we just say, hey, 
it's up to you to report. Um, you're not going to get a penalty. You'll more than likely be issuing yourself a 1099-R for retirement, and then you're going to say it's non-taxable, and you're going to pay it back. No, no different than if you took, like you rolled over an account. In fact, the way the CARES Act treats it is a trustee to trustee transfer. So, um, wow, there's a ton. What are you guys doing? Um, and let me just knock a few of these other ones out real quick. Uh, the $10,000 grant, actually, you can answer this one. Is it counted as income? No, um, it is not income. Uh, when the grandparents make the $15,000 gift, does the grandkid have to declare it on his income tax? No, it's a gift. It's it, not income. Um, somebody's still mad about the, uh, <laughs> about the insurance. Guys, I'm not an insurance person, but I'll tell you, I have three IUL policies. I've been using them for years. I borrow against them whenever I need money quick. It's cheap. And, and if I ever go a little bit nutty, and for those of you guys who know my situation, if we did not have long-term care for my dad, my dad had early onset of, uh, um, yeah, I'm just gonna say, uh, this is horrible. What's the one where you're Alzheimer's? Oh, oh my goodness. I was saying, like I have autism stuck in my head. I don't think he's the only one in the family with early onset. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, so, right there. Yeah, for literally for, um, eight years from the time that he started showing like six years hard mm. for and if we did not have long-term care um it would have really had a major effect on my mom or, or me uh because she i wouldn't have, like she needed to be able to stay in her house well you can't get those policies anymore so you have to have something that, that covers it so i use the index universal life and the uh, and whole life with the writers to have the long-term care. And, right. I, and I look at it and the really cool part of them, and I'm not telling you which way to go, um, is they're great for legacy building because all you have to do to have a whole bunch of money come in and really fund your plan is to, you just have to pass away someday. So if you do it right, it's actually fantastic. Now I'm not saying term is bad, I'm just saying it's not the panacea that a lot of people pretend like it is, or you just say buy a term and invest the rest. It's not my experience. My experience is that when you need it, you can't get it. So you better get something that you can absolutely lock in. I've had a few term life policies and they've never paid off. <laughs> yeah. You should sell it to somebody. We'll bet on it. Uh, could you please discuss trademark for LLC enforcing this against entities? Uh, probably not. So it sounds like you have an LLC, and that's a state issue. And a trademark is first use in interstate commerce. So, uh, so it sounds like somebody has a name on an LLC, and they want to get somebody else to stop using it. If you use it across state lines, then whether you registered it or not, you have a trademark. And I'll tell you, this was my weird thing. So, I, again, I just go off of my experience. My experience was I had clients that would want trademarks, and I would file these trademarks. And invariably, every time I would file a trademark, we're talking about some pretty – big trademarks, I would get hit with people saying that they used it first. And quite often it was stuff that I knew was concocted. And then they would offer to, to, to go away for 5,000 bucks. And I have to go to my client saying, look, it's going to cost you a lot more to enforce this trademark. And so I just finally got to that point where I was like, look, you used it first. You just put a TM under it uh, when you want to register it. And then when you register it, you use the R, but you can have abandonment issues. So I'm probably just going to say, unless it's like a super, super valuable piece of intellectual property, just wait. And if somebody pops up, then you show first use in interstate commerce. Nowadays we can back all that stuff. We can, we have the Wayback machine and the internet and all that stuff. And I used to have people send me their ideas in a sealed envelope and, and, uh, we would postmark it. And I said, here, I'll just put it in my file. And if we ever have to, you got this. Somebody says, I thought a flipper was a dolphin with a bad haircut. See, this is why we shouldn't allow the drinking during the tax Tuesdays. All right. Can you advise buying properties with your Roth IRA as a business? Here, let's, let's go over that. Cause I know that there's a, I got a question on that. Yeah, I know there's a question on there. All right. Those who work full time and have rental income, should they have an LLC or an S corp? rental income uh, i'd have the llc uh you guys are funny because an llc can be taxed as an escort yeah so LLC. the answer is yes yeah so <laughs> no you don't want an escort for uh investment property
stories. And the reason you don't, uh, with very few exceptions, the reason you don't is because if you take it out of the corporation, it's treated as active ordinary income. Like it's just like it paid you. It's an appreciated asset that is now taxable to the shareholder. So if you have rentals, you definitely want them to be a disregarded LLC or a uh, partnership LLC. Um, and the only issue is how many do you have? Do you want it on page one of your Schedule E or page two? Are you getting financing? Those types of things will sometimes change our analysis. Um, somebody says, hey, I'm impressed with, I'm going to say it's Jeff. He says you guys. But, uh, can you explain trading as an investor versus an active trader? We have about $3,000 in losses. I don't mean to laugh at that, but I always say that. This is when it gets bad. I always know who the after traders are because you all have huge losses. Um, you get rich slow in this world. Like I've been doing this for over 20 some years. Jeff and I look at returns all the time. When I see an active trader, 80% of the times you guys lose money. Mm -hmm. And everybody will go out there and say, you can make millions of dollars. Yeah, I can make millions of dollars playing basketball. If I learn how to dribble and I go through a few classes and I learn how to do a layup and then I go out there and LeBron James is standing in the key. Guess what's going to happen when I go up against LeBron James? He's going to take my little whatever I throw at him and he's going to swat it and it's going to go out of the stadium. It's probably going to break the wall. And he's going to say, what the heck? I've been doing this my whole life. I'm a giant. And I have all the physical attributes. Well, that's what the Wall Street guys are doing. They're the traders. There's traders that have not had losses at all for 365 days in a row. Goldman Sachs had an automated program that just nailed everybody. And it, play, it does head fakes and all these things. So we go out there and we think we're going to compete with these guys. Stop it. Don't <laughs> compete against them. Say, hey, LeBron James wins so i'm going to bet with lebron james and put him on your team that's what you do you and, don't and even one of the irs requirements for a trader is that you're look seeking to make profit on the daily changes it's it's frequency extent and uh what are there? frequency extent and volume yeah it's just am i smarter than these arbitrage programs and, and, i don't think so and then and then they will add new things to it so that when you have frequent, like we've had people with 15,000 trades in a year denied trader status. You just don't do it. In my world, you just don't do it. Right. Unless that's what you do and you're trading every day. You, we've had people, and I shouldn't say we, because Anderson doesn't do trader status. Like, have we ever, do we file it? I think we have one or two. We have a couple. That are actual, that's what they do for a living and they do it every day. And we'll, we'll, against our advice, we'll do it as a trader because there's no such thing as a trader. It's something that somebody concocted. And what you're doing is you're taking your your profits and you're putting it on Schedule D and your losses and your, your deductions on Schedule C, which doesn't make any sense. You're going to end up with no income on a Schedule C and you're going to get audited all the time. So, uh, so we don't mess around with that. Uh -oh, somebody says rule time. <laughs> yep, somebody's got it. It's where my parents met. It was in Montgomery. Um, it's just stuff you guys never knew that you didn't really need to, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, anyway yeah, my dad grew up in Mobile, Alabama. So, some people know. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to keep griping about traders. How do you do it? You have to be involved every day, even, even when you're six months uh, of activity in a year, and then you take six months of vacation because you made a bunch of they still deny you trader status because you're not doing it frequent enough. So I escape all that. I tell our clients to escape that. Use a LLC, tax as a partnership with a corporation as the general partner. You're not going to get to take those losses. What I'm going to do is encourage people to quit doing the active trade stuff and start doing the slow burn. You're going to make a ton of money. We have clients that clear four or $500,000 a year doing the dividend trading that we teach during infinity. We make money three different ways. We teach you how to buy good companies that are kicking out money that have been doing it historically 25 years at a minimum. 
and we show you how to make other profits off it, including like you could trade every day one of those companies. You could buy the company and then you could write 20 or 30 trades a day where you don't have risk. And that's what we choose to do. I don't like doing it the other way around. I hate betting. I, I see so many speculators and a few of them do it well, but the vast, vast majority of them lose their butts. 80%, I would say. I used to do the numbers and it was about 80%. And then I talked to other accounts. Oh, go back one. Oops, did I forget to answer? Somebody says, if we get a divorce, who gets to keep us? Um, Jeff. <laughs> All right. If I have a choice, is it better to buy real estate inside a Roth IRA or a QRP? Well, with the assumption that the QRP does not have a Roth in it, because uh, I, I kind of like the idea of buying and selling in a, in a, in a Roth. Okay, so the rub is always when you buy in a plan that doesn't have tax, if you have real estate, there's a good chance you're never going to pay tax. So you kind of. Mm -hmm. You kind of lose all the coolness of real estate. But if you have a choice, like, hey, I have a Roth and I have like some mutual funds to choose from, I'm probably going to run to real estate anyway. Now, here's a problem with, with investing or investing in real estate in a, on an IRA of any kind is you got to put enough money in it to do everything. Because you can't have debt. If you have debt, then you have something called unrelated debt finance income. You can't work on it yourself. You can't give it money for, you can't pay for things. Uh, it's just, you can't live in the property. Uh, so the Roth has to run this property like it's its own. You can't help it out. That's right. And you can't put yourself on the hook on any loans and you nope. can't pick up a hammer. Uh, it's like, ah, so QRP, you can actually have a loan in. And that QRP could be a Roth. The Roth just means you're never going to pay tax again. If it, but in it, but I don't get a deduction putting it in. And by the way, uh, from a tax standpoint, there's really no difference between a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA from a tax standpoint over about a 30-year horizon. If your tax level doesn't go up or down, and you're in a medium tax level. So for most people, there's not a big difference. If you're a young person and you don't have much income, then the Roth is your friend. If you're in a, if you're in your making money phases and it's way up, like your income is high, mm -hmm. then do a traditional if you can, or do a QRP or a, a, a defined benefit because it's really hard for the Roth to make up that first big chunk of deduction you get. So. Um, so I always look at it and say, which one's better? If I have to choose, I'm always using a QRP. And I'm going to do the Roth or the traditional stock or network. Again, if we're talking apples and apples. Um, if you have the money, for example, hey, I had a bunch of money from a previous employer. I rolled it out. Put it in a QRP where you can still leverage it. And you can get great returns out of real estate, even if you're not getting benefit from the depreciation. Um, especially if you're buying cheapy little properties. Like I buy a lot of little Forty thousand dollar, paying me seven eight hundred bucks a month type things, and that's just cash flow. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see. I know I have a bunch of questions and about extended deadlines. I thought I already answered the. Hmm. Yeah, let's re re answer re ask your question. I'll see if I can't get to it right now. If I can make this thing go forward, there we go. Uh, what is Mecking when you put two, so when they came up with the 7702 uh, provision in the tax code, rich folks were just dumping a ton of money into these because they never had to pay tax on it again. And if you overpay, like you put more in there than than would ever caught than would would cover the cost of the insurance, then it becomes a modified endowment contract, and all the the growth can be taxed to you. So there's a this is. This is more than I know. I know that that exists and I don't know the threshold of it, but it's a mathematical computation. If you own the life insurance policy inside of a nonprofit, like it's a key man policy inside of a nonprofit, which you can have, then it's still taxable. But remember that the nonprofit is exempt. So you can dump a whole bunch of money into a life insurance product and you really don't care because you're not going to get taxed on it. And if somebody says, who would I send you to? I'm going to send you to Eric Dodds just because he and I, he comes on and teaches in the infinity program with me and he's a fiduciary. 
And so I like Eric because he has to put your interest first. I like David McShane. Uh, he's right there too. Um, they're both fantastic people. David's a 40 year CFP, but he's not so much on the insurance side. So uh, Eric knows his stuff and he's a good dude. Uh, la, 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 la. Somebody says, uh, can old withdrawals from IRAs now be repaid without penalty under the CARES Act? Uh, no, you get a, you, so the way that the withdrawal worked is under the CARES Act, you get an exemption from the 10% penalty. And then so long as you pay it back within three years, uh, which is really the end of the third tax year, which is December 31st of 2022. Mm -hmm. that, right? then I don't have to pay uh, tax on it. It's treated as a trustee to trustee transfer. Um, Self-directed withdrawal due to COVID. What did he say? What about the CARE Act? You can take a, a self-directed withdrawal. We don't care about the self-directed side. You can take a withdrawal out of any IRA or 401k, 403b, 457, any of the qualified plans. And that was after February 15th or was it a later date? I think it's after March 27th because it's cash okay. that you can take that out. And you have two choices. You have two flavors. The early withdrawal, you never have the 10%. Pay it back within three years. You don't have to worry about tax. The other side is you can borrow from a, you can't borrow from an IRA, but you can borrow from a 401k, 403b, 457, you can borrow up to hundred thousand dollars. Right. Your administrator has to agree to do that. That's the only thing that we're seeing is that some of the administrators are being lazy and they said no. And frankly, it's because they want to keep control of your funding, your money, your funny money, your funny money. Uh, somebody says infinity workshop. That's an online only. So you don't have to come out here. Um, and there's no cost to it. I have received the PPP loan. And which increment should I disperse it? I'm a LLC tax of the sole proprietor, no employees. Um, all right, so the way it works is you have to pay yourself the average. So you, so whatever your average income was on a monthly basis, you pay yourself two times that amount. That's the most you can pay yourself. You, you're not allowed to do health. You're not allowed to do 401k. You are allowed to do rent. You are allowed to do interest on secured uh, property. So if you have loans on property that is secured by like UCC or uh, even a mortgage, then you can write off that interest and you can write off, I think utilities too, right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, they're talking, it's supposed to be over the covered period, which is eight weeks, but they're talking about extending that. In fact, there's uh, bipartisan support of extending that. And they're talking about making it something a lot longer, like 26 weeks. I know Rubio said 16. And they, 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 it's like, again, it's follow the bouncing ball. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, we did ask. Somebody says, did you ever get to my question? Yeah, we talked about the uh, tax extension and all the deadlines and stuff. Um, we're over bad like we're only half an hour, but it's like when we're half an hour over, then now I'm in trouble. So I'm going to bust through these last few ones. Can we use part of the PPP loan funding to fund my employee's pension 401k as well as my 401k? I'm a sole proprietor, not an S-Corp business. You have to use the PPP in the entity that actually received the PPP. It sounds like he's a sole proprietor, but he has employees. Okay. Um so yeah, you could you can use it for the pension, right? You can use it for the employees' pension. This is actually a really good one. Uh, they they keep giving us new guidance. You cannot use it for your pension contribution, so you can write off what the company pays for your employees. Mm -hmm. You can write off what you pay your employees. You can write off any health benefits you give your employees, but not for yourself because you're a sole proprietor. If you were an S corp then you could add all those other things. So they completely hose sole proprietors. And again, you probably last week or two weeks ago, I was griping. You're whining. I was mad because the sole proprietors completely got the short end of the stick here. They couldn't even apply well, for PPPs. But yeah, they made them wait to start. They made them wait, and then they're not going to give them the same benefits as, uh, as others. This is where it really hosed you to be a sole proprietor. 
and it's uh, stinky pinky, so it's not good. All right, uh, Q and A. What is it? Stop it. What are the basic benefits of the S corp? So you can answer. Well, that. You, the the first is, of course, you have a limited liability coming from the S corp. Uh, I'm going to go to the one that I find that the big difference between the partnership and the S corporation is that the S corporation income is not subject to self-employment income. That's the big difference. And otherwise they have a lot of the common characteristics. I'm going to give you one benefit. The accountable plan is huge. Yeah. The S corp can enter into an accountable plan with you and you could quite literally reimburse yourself and on average, it's about $20,000 a year that you can't do as a sofa. I mean, a lot of times we see um, uh, professionals have S corporations mm -hmm. making lots of money. They can set up defined benefit plans. We've done a few. Uh, and in a defined benefit plan, you can write off a lot of. The most we had uh, as a deductible contribution last year was $615,000 yeah. into one DB plan. That's a deduction. So if you don't know what a DB plan is, we'll have to chat about that next time. Uh, but there's a huge bunch of benefits of an S Corp. Uh, besides the accountable plan and the ability to receive the profits of your endeavors without being subjected to old age, death, and survivors in Medicare, um, it also gives you a certain amount of protection. So you want to have an entity around yourself. You don't. Most sole proprietors just do it in their name. And what they're going to find out is yeah, their business fails because of this coronavirus. They're not going to have insurance that's going to cover it because viruses and pandemics are usually excluded and it's going to follow them into their personal realm. So it gets really, really bad. So it's we want to have a box around this one, too. Um, what else? Tell me we're getting close. How do I go about researching business tax strategies? Like, where could I find a list of strategies? That's the free book, guys. <laughs> I'm just going to point you right there. Some of you guys are asking. I missed it the first time. Here you go. Tuesday. I know Patty's been giving everybody the, the book, but you can just go there. It's free. It's our gift to you. There's no strings attached. Uh, somebody says, who can I work with for passive rental income investments in North Carolina? I buy there. I'll send you to uh, Travis Howard. He's he's fantastic. He's in our Infinity Group, uh, and if you're if you like the the cruddier properties, because he's probably right around the he's Charlotte ninety. Uh, don't worry, Lynn. Patty's going to send you the link. It's it's in the chat, but she'll send it to you. Yep, there she goes. She's quick. That's Susan. Susan's like quick draw McGraw. Um, Anyway, I forgot what I was even talking about. Oh, North Carolina. If, North Carolina. if you like the the little cash flow properties, happy to share um, a few of them. Although I've had a few clients that came down there. And then the next thing you know, I'm getting like one out of five properties because they're just buying them all. So I may be a little cagey with you guys. I don't want to give you all my stuff because I still accumulate. Um uh, Let's see, if you're buying property in an opportunity zone, what advice or what do we need to know about the benefits? You're deferring the tax. And yeah, you do a special LLC for not only the uh, for your money, but also there's an LLC that's the fund. Um, you're deferring your money about six years. So the tax on it, you're still going to pay uh, on the initial capital gains because it has to be capital gains that you're rolling into it. And it could be an active business. It could be all sorts of stuff. Uh, and uh, somebody's going to send that to you, Indira. So uh, they're going to send you a link. Anyway, so you have this deferral. And then if you own that investment down there for 10 years, you don't pay any capital gains. And you don't pay anything until 2047. Then you get a step up in basis. You can choose to step up the basis. So you can uh, you can get that. Somebody says, where's the question slide? See, you guys are doing it to me again. Uh, there's your question slide. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say we have one more. If I did not yet file, if, if I have not yet filed a tax return for my corporation, do I still qualify for idle or PPP as a sole owner operator? 
Uh, for IDLE, they're going to accept your 2018 return. However, you're probably going to be asked for financials for 2019. What if they haven't filed anything for the corporation at all? Uh, I don't think you're going to get an IDLE then. You're going to get it. Are you? Yep. So all you had to do is be in business on February 15th. And so they'll take bank, they'll take well, on the idle. Yeah. It's easy. The PPP is the harder one because you're going to have a hard time proving the, uh, the payroll. So they'll, they'll even take bank statements, but it depends on the bank and who you're dealing with. Yeah. For the PPP, they, they're typically asking for uh, payroll reports. Yep. And, and, if, and, and if you're a corporation and you didn't take payroll, guess what you're not getting? The PPP. Right. And if you say, but I'm a sole proprietor, it's not going to work, guys. You can still do the idle. And yes, here's the weird thing with the idles. Um, the only loans they're processing is the first before they shut them down, unless you're an agricultural business. So since the CARES 2.0, they have not done a single ordinary idle loan for a traditional business. They are still catching up. Stinkola. Stinkola. We're not happy about that. Hey, guys. Uh, just throwing this back up. And somebody says the promo code. It's, ta it's Tuesday. Just big, uh, all caps, Tuesday. Now, for the One Veteran Foundation, if you guys could go out there and buy a T-shirt from these folks. Uh, Somebody just says, how do you get any, uh, the idol? You, you have to wait till they reopen it. You can't get one until they reopen it. So the people that they're servicing, everybody applied before uh, April 16th. Yeah, last I heard, they were only taking agriculture uh, applications. And I can tell you that I just did one where we got the money, and they're capped it at 150000 We just got $150,000, and what day was that? That was an April 6th one. So April 6th application. Application, right. And uh, you guys rock stars, uh, by the way. Keep keep getting uh, these guys. They're really cool. Dave uh, Rafus, you can look them up. One Veteran Foundation. It's a 501c3, so you can go look them up and see what they do. They, they don't spend anything on themselves. It's all for the pets. And here's the deal. You get a service member who has PTSD, a, uh, a service animal, and it's very hard for that vet to go down the dark hole. Now, let me add one thing to that, because we have uh, a lot of these P uh, veterans who with PTSD and have a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. Now, put on top of that, the COVID-19, the shutdown, they may be unemployed for the time being. It's really bad right it's now. It's really bad. So we need to give these people as much help as possible. Yeah, not just like the veterans. Yes, absolutely. But everybody. The uh, the stats, because I actually went on to what it was, One America, the Ledger Report, about, and I got yeah, I got into it with somebody. Oh, I wanted a Dr. Drews, too. And I, got, I yelled at a doctor, which you're not supposed to do, apparently. It's <laughs> frowned upon. You don't get invited back when you yell at a doctor. But I was like, hey, the uh, suicide rate goes up 1% every time. Yeah. Um, every time the unemployment rate goes up 1%. And we're sitting in a city, Jeff. We're, we're talking about 40% unemployment in Vegas before this thing's over. So, like, that's a lot of people. So I'm not saying anything about it bad about COVID. I'm just saying is that there's a lot of people suffering in some pretty dark places right now. Um, we will send you the one veteran link. Uh, this is Patty's got it. It's also in the chat feature, but we'll send it out to you guys. Again, it's not huge amounts of money. It's a $20 t-shirt. Like, frankly, it's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, we will send you the Facebook apps. We'll get you anything you need. You just reach out to Patty. She'll coordinate it. She knows Dave. He's over there in uh, in uh, right outside of Phoenix. Good dude. Pretty straight, straightforward. So anyway, if you help the vets, uh, I'll be eternally grateful. And like I said, I'll give you guys some reward uh, that uh, we'll do something. We usually um, encourage people to give. We love to give, and it feels good. So we'll encourage that by incentivizing you guys in some weird way. All right, andersonadvisors.com forward slash podcast. By all means, uh, all of our Tax Tuesdays get up there at some point. 
Uh, if you want to watch a whole bunch of replays, all the replays will be in your Platinum portal, but you can always go to iTunes. It's free. Google Play. It's free. Go on to any of our social media, and we would love to have you guys come in and continue to hang out with us. We love your banter back and forth. I wish I could get all of your questions. Where do you buy $40,000 houses? I get them all over the place. They're, they're out there. My goodness. Uh, it's, yeah, somebody's also asked the way that we trade. You can go, uh, Patty will give you all of the classes that we teach. I'm sure she will, because we've taught a bunch of them on webinars. And you you can test us, because we, we're boring. We just use companies that have really good businesses that pay out, like, consistently every year for, like, 50 years. And, yes, we go in there and cash, and we sell the option on them. We buy them back. If you want to sell the put to – to get put the stock put to you, you can get that money too. There's all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, and we'll get you Travis. Patty will give you guys Travis's information. He's in Charlotte, North Carolina. His houses are a little bit uh, a little bit better. And then uh, Eric Dodds is for uh, life insurance, and Patty will get you that too. Mina, I think I've I, I know your name, so I I probably have uh, emails too, so I get that. Uh, if you guys have questions. Uh, now, at this point, we have like 10,000 people that send us questions, and we don't charge anybody to, to respond to basic questions, just so you know. So just just know, don't kill us with them. But we get hundreds, and we try our very best to get through them. They grab, and they, they distill these down to usually about 50 questions every week. We're able to answer between 15 and 25 that are the questions and then we right. answer them and we try guys. It used to be that I was able to get through all of them. I know some of you guys get a little, give me this, the, a little bit of the stink eye where you're like, Hey, you know, my question didn't get answered. And we're trying guys. If you really have a, a question that's that you're having difficulty with uh, say second request or something, we'll grab it. Our people are seeing them and they're trying to get a, get you to folks. And then if you ask something that's really personal and you need to be invited. Join our platinum. It's a whopping thirty-five dollars a month, please. Uh, and uh, we'll get you. Hey, you know what, you guys? If you want the forty thousand dollars houses, I'm going to incentivize you. Come in and visit the Infinity. Go through our Infinity stuff. We actually taught a few on housing, uh, but also if you come and hang out with us at Infinity, what I'll do is I'll buy about uh, twenty or thirty of them, and I'll throw them at you guys during one of the courses. Um, cause we go in and we buy them in, in packages. So you were usually buying them in, in mass with a bunch of other folks and we'll peel off a bunch. So if you like them, we'll just, I'll buy them and you guys can just, whatever I got them for, we'll just figure out how to get them over to you guys. Uh, but I tend to buy the, the, the ones that aren't going to require a lot of money. They're easy to maintain. They're always, uh, occupied and, uh, it's, it's, it's plenty easy. Uh, somebody says, are there new rounds of PPP that are coming for people who have not applied before? There's still $150 billion left under the PPP. You can still apply. Uh, so stop that. Uh, well, hey, we'll send you guys all out the infinity information uh, after the event. I'll have uh, Susan, if you could tack on the next infinity uh, maybe if they want to go in there and look at some of the videos, we could do that. Um, and we'll get you all set up. I didn't mean to throw that at you, Susan and Patty. Sorry, guys. But they, they love it when we change things midstream. Right. And we don't tell them because that way life's exciting. So anyway, They thought we were done. They, thought, yeah, <laughs> they were ready to go home. No way. Um, anyway, I hope you guys, are, you guys have a great one. We'll see you in two weeks. In the meantime, we'll get you guys out some more information. Go out and do some good things and help people and call the folks that are uh, that are still afraid to go out. I have an 80-some-year-old mom that uh, she goes a little stir-crazy. She keeps telling me she's going to go to the grocery store. I have to convince her to stay, stay put for a little while longer. Um, anyway, uh, most financial institutions are no longer – reach out to us, Donna. We'll, we'll get you guys. There's, there's some that are, but there's a lot that are, and we'll be able to tie you into them. So just reach on out to us. We'll get you squared away. All right, guys. Mm-hmm.